Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming early for the pre-concert conversation. My name is Judah Adashi. This is Ted Hearn. This is David T. Little. And they are our featured composers on today's show. Please have a seat. And we'll just get started as people trickle in. Um, normally, I try to plan these out a little bit. I feel like it's a little more of a talk show format. I let them plug their projects and that kind of thing. But this is kind of, I feel like, a little bit of a different opportunity to discuss wider ranging issues. And on that note, I hope you all chime in, not necessarily just at the end, but if you want to participate along the way, please feel free. Um, I've followed David and Ted's music for a long time. Um, David and I kind of knew each other. Ted and I hadn't really crossed paths until more recently, but they're both young composers who I feel like have very distinctive and personal approaches to basically integrating or exploring the intersections between music and all things socio-political. Um, and I think they probably have some overlap and some very different ideas also about what it means to write so-called political music. Um, my students here know that this is something I like to talk about a lot and kind of ask the question, what is political music? What does that even mean? Um, we kind of compare and contrast examples. We've certainly looked at uh, David's Soldier Songs, his recent opera, um, Ted's Katrina Ballads, um, but I think that just scratches the surface. So I think the place to start, and then we'll just see where it goes, um, the title of the show that I went with for this is Until the Next Revolution, and I brazenly stole that from an editorial that David wrote in the New York Times like two years ago, entitled Until the Next Revolution, um, and in it he kind of sets forth the four-page redux of his dissertation, I suppose, yeah. uh, which is about this whole phenomenon, phenomenon of how, how music and politics kind of interact for him, how he's kind of come to the views he has, um, and in particular this sort of dichotomy he sets up between uh, revolutionary music and critical music. So I'm going to let him like talk a little bit about that, and then maybe Ted will chime in, and we'll see what happens. But why don't, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about kind of how you got to where you are, where you are in terms of your music yeah. and your thinking. Okay, this. cool. Well, first, thanks for having all of us here. It's a pleasure. Um, great to be back in Baltimore um, and on the series, which is this amazing series I've been following for a long time, so it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so Until the, Rev the Next Revolution was, in fact, a sort of four-page redux of my dissertation, which um, my goal in writing the dissertation was to examine the historical trends of political music from 1917 through the present and to try to find trends. And what I found was that there were really two significant peaks of political music, one um, in the 1930s and one in the 1970s. And both of these peaks were really specifically concerned with particular revolutionary ideological change. Um, in the 30s, composers like Hans Eisler and Mark Lidstein, um, and Aaron Copeland and um, Charles Seeger and all the Composers Collective, this whole group. And then in the 70s, people like Louis Andreessen and Frederick Chevsky and Cornelius Cardew and Christian Wolff. And each of them, you know, social movements were really, in, in many ways, um, pushing the music in certain directions. You know, in particular with some of Chevsky's work, he said that there was a point in the late 60s, early 70s where they were performing, I think, with MEV, his, his um, electroacoustic improvisation group uh, for a bunch of sort of radical activists and they kind of called, the activists called the musicians out and said, well this is fine, but what are you doing to serve the revolution? And they said, that's a good question, let's think about that and we'll get back to you, kind of. And then that kind of marked a shift in what they, they did. Um, but then looking at um, what was happening now and thinking a lot about Ted's music and my music and other colleagues of ours, that really seemed to starting around, really, really, really around the 2000s, I think, to really engage with political issues again through music and to, um, but in a different way. And that's where this idea of till, until the next revolution came in and the idea of revolu revolutionary music versus critical music, that the music in the 30s and the 70s were really revolutionary and that they had this particular goal of revolution, whereas um, the music that I, that I was seeing written this new, more recent batch was really not as much concerned with particular specific revolutionary change as <coughs> with a kind of, for lack of a better word, criticism of, of what was happening in society and in our country and the world 
um, and, and had a, uh, the goal, if there was one in particular, was less of an immediate goal of revolution and more of a gradual um, evolutionary kind of approach to, um, to these topics. And so that's where, those, that's where those two categories came out of, which I just kind of, I made them up based on what I was seeing. Um, but, um, Can I ask you, uh, sorry to interrupt, when, no, no. when, when did, uh, when you were talking about these periods in the yeah. 30s and 70s, were you including, um, was this, is this just limited to notated music? Yeah, I was looking specifically at like composers, like more traditionally uh, uh, defined, mm -hmm. and, and mostly in the United States also. Cool. So occasionally extending, to, you know, I mean, Louis Andreessen comes in because he had a great influence on the composers in the United States, so he sort of, there are a couple of these extension composers, um, but mostly American composers. Hmm. Do you think that the trends can continue in non-notated music, or that's... Um, I, think that the trends that? I think the trends were, they may be different. I mean, I know there's this great book by Michael Denning called The Cultural Front that talks a lot about jazz culture at that time, mm -hmm. and um, like Duke Ellington Swedes, and how they were all part of, that was what was unique about The Cultural Front, was that it was this united front against fascism that included all of these, these Individuals and organizations and perspectives that hadn't been merged before. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely part of that. And now, I mean, even now you have a lot of like Fred Ho's work, which kind of yeah. lost his own order. Um, Do you guys know Fred Ho? Awesome composer. Yeah, really great. Yeah. Really great. Um, yeah, and, and Fred Ho's been sort of, I don't know, I, like I didn't learn about Fred Ho until last year. Oh, I've really? been in New York for 14 years and like he's a, he's a mainstay there, but his, yeah. his music doesn't get any play in the like the, the classical contemporary world for yeah. some reason. He, well, he's tricky. He, he started his own big band mm -hmm. to do his music and played his own concerts, and then he got sick. He's, he's very, very ill right now and has been for a number of years. And so his music is kind of, his music was very much dependent upon him doing it yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And now um, Marie Contrera has, is now in charge of his band, and, and he's actually entered hospice and is not really expected to live much longer, but his band is now sort of taking on its own you know, to, to try to continue uh, his work and carry on his tradition of his work. Yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting that's already kind of coming out of this, and certainly is true in your article, is I mean, you were writing a dissertation. So you, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. you were studying trends, you were trying to label things. Trying and to trying to narrow things. Sure. So what we get, you know, I mean, yeah. we, we all teach, so we all deal with this, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that once you start doing that, you're leaving a lot of stuff out. Yeah. So like, I think that we have sort of a, a canon of political composers. But you know what is what does that mean? So I think we all can kind of come to we say, okay, Frederick Jevsky is this political composer. He, but would, he would say he's not. He would, right, right. Most of them actually would argue yeah, that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And I, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And in fact, I think some of the composers who who maybe aren't known for that are the ones who convey some kind of political thinking in a much more sort of artful way, which is fascinating. Like I, this is this is a very obvious example, at least to me. But. Um, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never, I've never heard Steve Reich talk about himself as a political composer, and yet, I think you know, from the early take pieces, you know, he's he's really already doing stuff that's engaging with the socio-political kind of landscape and with race and with all these things, but he doesn't really talk about it. Well, it's he's not it's not really a program note kind of thing. There's there's one. It's just his material. There's an interview where he he does actually, okay. and it's one of the most problematic statements. I've encountered. Uh, it's interesting, and I see where he's coming from. But he basically, he basically says any composer that thinks that they can change the world is delusional. Uh -huh. And he says, let's talk about Guernica, uh, Guernica Picasso. He says, one of the greatest works of art in the 20th century did nothing to stop the bombings in Spain. As a politician, Picasso is an abject failure. And that's, some of that is quoted, and some of that is a paraphrase. I can't remember exactly. And yeah, he's kind of right. But he's also speaking, you know, I don't know that anyone is saying that a painting can stop bombing, but that painting becomes a symbol, and a symbol has power. As an aside, I'm curious, and I think I know some of the answers to this, so I've never talked to each of you about it. Do, do you guys see yourselves as artist activists? Or do you, is that not something you define yourself as? Um, I, Whatever I, that means to I, you. No, I don't, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, I have great respect for activists, mm -hmm. and that's a, I mean, it's weird, you know, so I, a lot of these debates to me come down to, to, to um, they're like semantic debates, mm -hmm. terminology debates, which, you know, I, it's really hard to not get bogged down in that, you know? So like political, you know, I have one sort of 
rant that I go off of that I'm sure I've gone off on with you, which is like everything's political, all music is political because it's, it's like tied to a time and a place and you can never escape that. And anyone who thinks that they're writing like music that's eternal or something, it's impossible. Well, also it's an act of creation and that in itself is a political act. Of right, and it's also tied to whoever is experiencing it. I so, mean, one, one of the things you know, that Ted did when I was just, when we were kind of kicking around repertoire for this concert, you know, Ted's pretty well known at this point for this piece, Katrina Ballads, written five years after Hurricane Katrina. But I asked him for pieces, and he sent me like two or three chamber things and instrumental. And it wasn't really overtly clear from anything about them what, if any, political engagement they were dealing with. And it became clear to me that was deliberate, because you weren't necessarily looking to just throw, you know, a sort of, you know, plug this into your political program kind of piece. And I thought right. that was great. No, totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, for, for me, I mean, um, you know, I don't think that, uh, you, you know, I think that the, the thing about a, a, a piece of art that is, that can be effective politically is, 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 is the quality that makes uh, the audience able to, uh, can help an audience like see something in their own life in a different way, you know? And so really, to me, it, whether or not a piece is effectively political has nothing to do with if it engages whether it's with, with, yeah. right, right, with like politicized topics, you know, and, and it has way more to do with um, with the with challenging the audience um, to see something uh, that they're not they're not expecting to see, and the musicians, you know, or, or perhaps, and the musicians, yeah. right, and, and the composer, and the composer themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. And to get back to your activist question, I mean, I you know just I, just to finish that thought, I don't I I hold the word activist, I, I define it very narrowly because I have a great respect for real activists too. Who, you know, who the, the, who can change their life and craft their life to really serve um, serve a cause, or you know, uh, and the activists that I that I really admire, you know, they're they're dedicated to to fighting against you know oppression and injustice, and uh, really risking risking that, risking their identity with that, you know, and um, and I don't do that, you know. I had this the same conversation as part of a larger one with John Luther Adams last spring, and. He kind of went from being an activist to being an artist, and he kind of said a few times, you know, I decided that this was the best way I could, I could serve, you know, my ideals. Yeah, and I'm not really an act. I mean, I don't think, yeah, I don't think he defines himself as much as an activist now. I think that was a part of his life. Well, another example is Bob Ostertag, mm -hmm. who, you know, has done some very serious activism. Is someone I respect immensely. Um, you know, was involved with the Yes Men at one point. Was in South America. Or was, you know, involved in the Civil Wars. Putting his life in danger, in very serious ways, um, and a number of works, of artworks for him came out of that. But um, the, I think, on some level, on some level, they are all part of who he is. And he has this great book called Creative Life, where he sort of talks about these all in one kind of sphere. But they, there are very different kinds of activities. Um, I, I would say I agree with Ted on that question. You know, the works that I write, I write because they're the ones, the pieces I feel like I have to write, and they happen to um, very often explore these topics. Some of which are political in nature, um, others of which are not. You know, but uh, but that in and of itself that isn't what defines them as political or political music. Well, that depends on how you define. It. I mean, well, you know, sure, sure. I mean, I think I, we're gonna have, yeah. And, I, and this I is where it gets have, really. I like, hope we have a hard time well, logging in on that because I don't think yeah, there yeah. is one way to look at it. It's really not. It can be really not. Yeah, totally. And I don't know if like def defining political music is is important. I mean, you know, I, I I think it really depends on who's listening to it and what it does for them and the form that it's in. You know, and and I mean, this is notated music. You know, um, you know, we all teach at music conservatories, um, and you know, the people who go to those places are largely privilege, largely white, you know, this is like, the, this is the part of the culture that we're in. It's not, we're not in, uh, you know, vacuum. I mean, this is like, we're, we're dealing with certain people and communicating to them. And, you know, I mean, like, I, can, like, I live in Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn. Um, you know, if I, you know, walk down the street in Brooklyn and, like, flash a peace sign and I'm like, man, this war, this war is bad, man. I mean, I'm not going to get a lot of resistance to that sentiment necessarily. But if I do it, like, at a military base, it's a completely different thing, right? And uh, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind when I think considering what what a work of art, um, how, how it exists in the world, you know? Does that make you differently conscious of what kind of audiences you're dealing with? 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for, yeah. you know, I, I don't know, I would love to hear you talk about this too. Um, but I think we both, we both feel, you said something to me, we're, 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 um, we're trying to have, we're having a very slow conversation about, um, about political This is actually the first art. time I'm proud to say that these yeah. two have had a public Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're having a private I conversation. I really wanted this, this to happen. So. Oh, yeah, no, and I thank you for it. This is <laughs> yeah, awesome. Great. You know, um, uh, but, but we're, we're having a conversation over email very slowly. We're trying to parse out some ideas because it's a very hard thing to talk about. Um, and, and, and I'd like to hear you, you talk about it. Uh, you know, for me, like, I feel like um, very uncomfortable with, with my position in the world as you know, like just there are circumstances that are beyond my control that have led me to have the life that I have, you know, and like, you know, we're very lucky to be, you know, a privileged American and living in Brooklyn. And I'm very lucky to have a life as a composer. I love my life. I, I can make art for a living and it's amazing, you know, but I'm uncomfortable with that. And I'm uncomfortable with um, the way that, you know, a lot of, well, I feel that there's a idea in classical music that um, that I don't know we're, that we're all privileged for a reason, you know. That like this music is the best music, and um, you know that's not true. Like we all know that there's all sorts of music. You know, I mean, you know, notated music is can be great and can be bad. It's like anything. But I'm uncomfortable with that, and I don't know how to deal with. It. <laughs> but I also love music. I also love the life I have, and I want to like work those things out. And that's for me. That's the, that's the reason I try to like engage with. I try to engage with that in, in art, you know. Um, and so, I, I so some of your art is like a working out of this. I think all of it, all of it is, yeah. you know. I mean, all of it that's that's um, that, I'm, that I'm proud of in any way is, has something to do with like, wait, why am I why am I doing this? And, you know, I mean, um, so. Yeah, I think. I think you know, it's a, somewhat similar. You know, having had the privilege of the education that I've had has given me time and resources to get into things that maybe people with less time or less resources of that particular kind would be able to get into. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Well, we have the luxury to have this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, totally. Yeah. And um, there's, some, there's something to that that I think you know, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, um, and this is super problematic in a lot of ways, but I, like say, but I wouldn't feel comfortable taking that and making, personally, just sort of abstract, absolute music. That something about that doesn't feel like, not that, it, not that it's wrong or anything, but it's just not for me. So you don't have anything in your catalog that is Sonata number one, period. Not Sonata number yeah. one. I mean, I have. Well, I, don't, I don't either, and I don't know yeah. that you do. I think we all, at least, at least our titles are all. There's something. There's yeah. something. There's something extra musical. Yeah. Not necessarily political by any means. Well, but Sonata number one is a pretty political title. This <laughs> <point>. <laughs> yeah, right. At this point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, I came to music not necessarily through music, but through theater and mm -hmm. writing. I came to music after I was already very active. Which, which are media that I think have this conversation a lot more. I mean, I think part of why this conversation interests me so much, and as a teacher I'm always kind of uh, bringing it into the classroom, is because we talk about it very extensively and openly about dead composers, you know. Mozart and the French Revolution, and, yeah, right, but, right. but it's like sure. it, it kind of diminuendos until like, you know, we're just, we don't really talk about it. With it. I mean, I, and I think actually one of the, for better or worse, and I'm not sure how you feel about this, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know if it, if it makes you feel good, bad, or uh, sort of mixed that you you know you get a call from me saying, well, we're doing a program on politics and music, so we're going to do some Fred Jeffsky, some David Lillard. Right. I mean, that's part of part yeah. of a reputation that certain pieces of yours have landed. Now, I also just really like both of your music. It's not arbitrary. It's not let's find the political composers, but I think you know it's interesting to kind of carry that around and, and sort of that some people mark you that way. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Does, I, but I don't know. I, obviously, you could have said, yeah, I'd rather not be on a program like that. No, of course right. not. I would never do that. No, this is awesome. I mean, this but is I, just, I, I think it's interesting. And, interesting. Yeah, 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 and it's great that you're having, you know, we're having a conversation yeah. about it, which is, which is good. But like, um, you know, uh, why do you think it is that, um, that it's, that we can, 
simultaneously talk about the connection that older composers from previous centuries had to, um, you know, to the world that they lived in, to the stuff that was going on, and then simultaneously um, say that those kind of connections weaken or are, are a distraction from absolute music, whatever that is. Like, how, why is it that that, what, what does it mean that we say that, or why is it? Well, I mean, you, you brought up the, the culture that at least the three of us and some of our audience members are in, which is, can be sometimes a, a practice room culture. Uh, you know, there's less talk about literature and politics and art. Um, you hope not, but sometimes there is. And I think, uh, I mean, you talk about it in, in your essay, and until the next revolution, you say some people feel that, you know, bringing these things into music, even into the conversation, taints it in some way. That, you know, some people see music as this elevated thing, especially classical music. And I, I, I find that notion very disappointing. Very I mean, I think it's good if it's yeah. tainted, honestly. <laughs> Me too. But I think that is that is an idea that's out there. Um, I think that that's, that's you know it's a source of discomfort for people to engage. Which I also think is good. Yeah, yeah. No, we wouldn't be doing this if that weren't the case. But I think there's still there's still relatively little of it in a way. I find. Sorry, there's a, you had a comment. Yeah, there. please, yeah, I, Linda. You know, I find it curious Another that, conservatory teacher. So let's hear what you have to say about it. So I, I find it curious though that that um, you know the, the discussion about politics is all kind of external. It's like a reflection on external politics. When in, you know most other art forms, if you look at theater, if you look at literature, if you look at dance, you know their political activism was within the culture of dance, was within the culture of theater, and so it was really, you know, looking at their own culture and trying to create a revolution in the culture of, of their own art form, you know, and in the kind of culture surrounding that, um, rather than just thinking, oh, you know, are we political if we Right. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, so, I think that and that that kind of idea um, is. I mean, that's that's more inspiring to me personally because I would agree. You know, especially because of the kind of. I mean, there there are, there are some political musicians who, you know, who reach uh, a hugely diverse popular audience and, you know, you know are not afraid to say to say things that are regarding external events and, and maybe have a lot of impact, but. But this is not that. This is not that at all. You know. I mean. Um, I mean, I, w I would argue that we're doing what you're talking about now, actually. That and when if, if you're doing this in the classroom, you're doing some of that, changing the culture within. Well, I, I yeah. also think. I mean, you know, both Ted and I have been very involved in starting our own groups, running our own groups. I think, you know, which were kind of, you know, thinking about like future your ballads or your bad self, which are not really. 100% comfortable in the classical conservatory world. I mean, my ensemble music speak is eight amplified musicians can be very loud. You know, really draws on rock music as as an equal kind of language to composed rotating music. You know, so I think that there is there is parallel to that. I guess it, I, for me, I guess the difference is that that at least in my own work that runs parallel and is equally as as important, but it active somewhat not separately but parallel to the more direct external engagement, at least, at least for me. Because I definitely agree, and I think that there is the apparatus of what we do that needs addressing on a regular basis. And if you talk, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's unfortunate that for a lot of people, you know, John Adams' Nixon in China is a political piece simply because it happens to talk about Nixon. Yeah. That really doesn't... Yeah, I mean, right. in some ways it's more political because it's amplified. You know, right. It, yeah. It, it recontextualize it. I mean, it, it, Rindy Eckert, a great director and writer, said something um, to me once, which was that you, the microphone is the most important aspect of the 20th century. Without the microphone, you could never have had Hitler, which was, I think, a pretty—I mean, it's a big statement, but I think it's—I think it's significant. And to have, for me, to have a world of classical music that sort of won't embrace or address that instrument that is so significant to the world in general, I found really problematic just in my own work. And, you know, yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, thanks for, thankfully that's, that's changing a lot, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, but I mean, uh, but you're absolutely right. And the, you know, the, the, the roles that, um, that, the role that music is supposed to play within a certain art form, within a certain musical culture, I mean, those, those hierarchies, I mean, you can have art that, that, um, that comforts you by by affirming those hierarchies, and you can have art 
that um, deliberately challenges those hierarchies, you know? And, uh, and I think the art that deliberately challenges those hierarchies is, that's an effective political statement, regardless of whether there's any text in it, or, you know, um, or if, if it's about some politicized topic, I mean, that's really, that's really irrelevant. Now, I, I, on the other hand, though, you know, the, just being a contrarian, and I think you probably are too, the, you know, just growing up, in, like my mom's an opera singer and I grew up in classical culture and, and there's a, there, I, there was at least growing up, there was a sense of, you know, you don't, you're not supposed to engage with that stuff. And with amplification? Or no, no, I'm talking like with, with um, political, external political ideas or anything that ties you to your, your own time. When did that change for you? When did that, when did that start to not uh, resonate with who you wanted to be? Oh, well, I mean, almost immediately, because anytime anyone tells me what to do, I, like, <laughs> will not do it, and yes. usually to my detriment, you know? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I mean, I think the Brandenburg Concerto is a really good political piece, you know, because they are these chamber concerti that do not, you know, they do not affirm the dominant roles that the instruments of those times were supposed to play. You know, there's some with no violins. And violas have the, have the main part, you know, and they have their weird instrument combinations, and you know, they're, that's that's Bach saying, no, I'm not, I'm not going to write what I'm supposed to write. You know, and that's a that's a super political act. And of course, you know, they were barely performed when he was alive. Um, you, sorry, no. I was just going to say you have you have a piece that we were considering doing before we decided to do this more recent piece. We were thinking about doing this piece, one of us, one of them, mm -hmm. which of course has this, you know, nice adversarial. In fact, a lot of your pieces have that kind of yeah. Push, push and pull aspect to them in the title and in the music. But that piece, from what moment you told me about it, did have something to do with like the, maybe the inner workings of the, the musical hierarchies you're talking about. Is that right? Is that fair? Um, yeah, it did. And, and the, I mean, I think the, yeah, the title yeah. was just like right after, you know, was, this was like sort of mid-Bush era. I wrote it as an older piece. And uh, so that had something to do with, um, with the general environment. But the reason that I, I really wanted to do this piece that's a newer piece is that I think that the those ideas are more, it's, it's definitely more thought out. I was, it, tried to, I was able to find a way where that, that metaphor made more sense to me, you mm -hmm. know, in this piece of the movement. So actually I think that is um, probably better to talk about it. Any. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about both of the, your pieces in the yeah. program. And maybe we'll talk, I, I don't know whether it's actually an interesting question unto itself, whether you'd like to introduce your pieces and contextualize them, and we can decide that before we go on. But um, one of the really interesting things I did not think about when programming the show uh, Ted's piece, the title of Ted's piece, Furtive Movements, uh, makes allusion to a you know, direct reference to a phrase found in police reports in New York City um, where the stop and frisk policy, when you, you can stop people, stop and frisk people on account of furtive movements, which is this incredibly ambiguous idea. And David's piece, And the Sky Was Still There, is a piece, a documentary piece, takes interviews, right? Interview, direct interviews. And it's all about don't ask, don't tell. Now, I guess the thing that struck me, and, and you can say more about the pieces, but the thing that strikes me that's really fascinating is that these two pieces are on this program, and both of those things are, the landscape is shifting on these things, um, both on Stop and Frisk in New York and Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I'm just, I'm curious, I really don't have a specific question. I'm curious how you feel about that. When you wrote them, maybe that wasn't the case. I mean, when did you write uh, And the Sky Was Still There? But years, so years before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was not, actually overturned? I think not all that long uh -huh. before. But the interview itself was done in, I think, 2005. Okay, yeah. Um, it was originally, it was an interview that is sort of an outtake from Soldier Songs. Oh, okay. And it was an interview with a, a, a bassoonist who I happened to meet at the Aspen Festival, Amber Ferenz, um, who, you know, I was just starting to write Soldier Songs and I was telling her about it. She's like, well, you know, I totally got thrown out of the army, right? I was like, no, I didn't do that. It's like, and I was in the Air Force before that, and I was like, oh. And we just sort of, I mean, we just became really good friends that summer, and I later on just said, you know, will you talk to me about that? And, and so she just sort of recorded, I didn't actually get to go down and talk to her directly, but she recorded her story and sent it to me. And a lot of it ended up in Soldier Songs, but then there was this one story about um, her coming out and being thrown out of the, of the military. Um, that was just, the way she told it was just this, it was so poetic and beautiful, and was this sort of moment of sort of epiphany in her life. Um, it was just a gorgeous story, but that also had this, this political aspect to it. And it didn't really fit into the landscape of soldier songs, which was more specifically dealing with 
training and, and combat and PTSD sort of arc. Um, and so some of her words, especially about basic training or in social songs, but then this, I just felt like it needed to be a different, a separate piece someday, so. Had, had, it, had you reflected on the fact that you have this piece that is a monument to an experience that people sh will no longer have? Well, that particular experience is one people will no longer have, but, right. but right. it's a kind of experience that unfortunately Conti people will Continues in other ways, yeah. yeah. And I think that's, for me, that's the way I tend to think about things now. You know, like this um, new record that I have out called Haunt of Last Nightfall, which is specifically about the massacre at El Mazote in El Salvador in 1981, but is more generally about you know, power dynamics and proxy warfare and secret military guerrilla training and government cover-ups, all of which happened with the United States military in the training of death squads in South America. You know, I mean, that, I, you know, that doesn't stop. Right. That particular event has... has so in a way, been, these pieces are microcosms of some kind of continuum of things that... Unfortunately, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even if it wasn't, I mean, you know, history is, for a million reasons, a really important thing then. Oh, it's important. Right. I just, I mean, I'm mostly just curious right. what it feels like. I think, I think it's fascinating. I hadn't, even, like I said, it hadn't occurred to me that yeah. that these things are for, for good, for bad, they're evolving. And that you knew that when you wrote the pieces, but the, the issues were, I don't know. I think we're we're pleased to see them evol evolving in some ways. Um, we don't know where. You know, at, at Stop and Frisk is an even more insidious example of something that. May oh, never sure. change. Uh, right, right. Has not changed and will not change. Well, no. I, th I mean, I think, I think, it, I think it will. I mean, I think it, that policy has come under a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, that piece for the movements from for tonight is it's not a, it's not like about stop and frisk. And right. It's not. It's not about raising awareness of that or, mm -hmm. or even you know protesting it or something you know, um, uh, which I mean, which you know of course I do. I don't think I don't think it's a good policy. But, but it's more about examining. I mean, basically, it's like it's like okay. I think I think that I think it's fucked up. I think stop and frisk is fuck, fucked up. It's a it's racial profiling. Why is racial profiling bad? Like, why is it why is it illegal? It should be illegal. It is illegal. Why? And it's you know, and, and thinking about just that that idea that uh, that the phrase furtive movements. It's what it's what it's the most commonly cited reason that people get get frisked. You know, it's a violation of their Fourth Amendment rights. And, uh, did you start with the title? As, I, uh, as a concept for the yeah, piece? Yeah, I did. I did. I didn't know if I was going to end up even calling it that because it's it's a you know it's an abstract musical piece. Right. But but um, the last but, line of your program is, right, but the just thing, explains what it is. Right. right. Well, yeah. the, the yeah. thing the thing the thing about it is you know I mean it says the phrase says more about the observer than the person who's doing it. Right. right? I mean right. it's like the it says it, it it's implying someone's guilt based on movements that imply and it implies something that they did and you're basically it's it's the observer is has a role set out for a person that 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 they have that they will They're also looking for fulfill. somebody to fulfill that. Yeah, they yeah. will fulfill that and it, it, they fulfilled it already, even if they haven't really. So it's just a preemptive, right? And the idea so I was just trying to think of how that idea could be extended to music and hmm. and um, so you know this piece is for is for a cello and, and, and a drummer and they're very, very different instruments, timbrely and acoustically, you know, and um, when I thought about how they could go together I mean, the easiest thing, the thing that I kept coming back to is that, you know, they're defined by their differences and they, and they, they can have these very opposite roles. And that just seems so um, uninteresting, you know? And it was really like, like, so I think the project of the piece is like how to um, put these instruments in roles that are uncomfortable and, and how to help them, you know, so I mean, they're, they, play, they, they play rhythmic roles, they both play rhythmic roles, they both play melodic roles. They overlap a lot. They play in unison, and then they separate and and do the things that they're supposed to do. You know, um, but it's sort of like what is, you know, it's just about separating the identity of a individual from the expectations that are grafted upon that individual. You know, and sort of putting that metaphor onto a cello and a drummer. And also, I like stuck a cork, a wine cork, in the middle of the cello just to make it as to not allow it to sort of speak. As beautifully in the way that it was it was supposed to do so, you know, um, just to sort of try to hammer on that metaphor or something, I guess. So there, you know? yeah, so there's a right. real there's a distance. I mean, I, I, there's there's sort of lots of refractions between you and the actual 
political matter. I mean, it's it's really playing more with questions of identity and philosophy, and I mean, it's, it's it gets pretty far removed from the, you know, again, the, you know, the kind of documentary interview work that you've done, um, which, of course, you use found materials, you used quotations of Katrina ballads, but right, have right. you done that in other pieces? Um, yeah, 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 sometimes, um, but. But again, I mean, like, whose audience? This is like a this is a this is a weird this is a weird piece of experimental music in a way, you know. Right. And it's like, hey, so I mean, if there was, if, there was, if if I was gonna protest uh, stop and frisk in, in any like meaningful way or try to change people's minds, I mean, I don't know. I'd write a piece of music for the NYPD, or so you would write. That's not this piece, <laughs> you know. You'd write or, revolutionary music. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, is there like what is that piece? That's not that's not music that I can write. The NYPD. You know? Or maybe you know more effectively, just be an activist. You know, um, I think this is about examining the ideas that are that are behind it, and how like we actually are connected to it. Do you feel like that's a higher level of abstraction than, than in your work? Because um, on the surface, to me, it is, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, but I think we're both interested in um, ideas beyond the the specifics. Yeah, it's know, not. It's not about. I mean, I feel like this conversation has happily brought out that it's not just about the content or sort of name checking yeah, yeah, yeah. a revolution, a tragedy of this yeah, yeah. or that. It's, it's about engaging with these things on a more personal and conceptual level. And I think you can you can see that happens mm -hmm. and it's I think it's very clear when it's happening uh, and it's, it's a little it can be a little gross, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well one of the things you also David also says in this essay is, you know, the art has to come first and he wants to yeah, make yeah. good art first and foremost. And if you don't I mean that was one of the great really fun things about writing this dissertation is just being able to dig through all this really just kind of bad like revolutionary propaganda music. yeah from these specific, from these particular movements um, some from really you know excellent composers who put their the ideology at the fore of, of the project some of them are like the NYPD piece you didn't write <laughs> well there's this great my favorite example besides this piece there is only one lie there is only one truth by Cornelius Cardew who's a really interesting composer and really important, really important thinker about um, this, this subject. And I actually really love the piece, it's a choral piece, but it's, uh, it's, it's all about the Sino-Soviet split and Brezhnev and Mao, and it's just like, it's so dense with words and just, it's very peculiar. I think it's on Ubu Web, if you guys want to check it out. It's, it's, I, I, it is actually one of my favorite pieces, but it's also very ineffective. You know, it's stop the stop being art for you at some point and become kind of just. Well, it's it's like very. It has a very specific function. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a lehrstuhl. You know, it's like it's for teaching, it's to teach the masses. Um, but there's also this incredible arrogance in when you read his writing about the masses, and you know, he he was president. His, uh, Cardi was president of the, the world premiere. In fact, I think Haldoran has a world premiere of coming together in Attica, half of which we're here tonight. And I think the, um, he's got this great critique of both that and a piece by um, Christian Wolff. And there's some line in the, the criticism where it says, the, the driving rock rhythms of, of Frederick Shevsky's coming together should be discouraged among the masses. It's really no, but no better than the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction. And the masses get enough of that as it is. And it's like, well, what? Like, no, it's Cardi, the Cardi, yeah, something similar to that. Not a direct quote, but yeah, and I'm just like, you kidding me? Like, just really, and that kind of like arrogance I find really off-putting. And then you hear that, then to go from that to there is only one lie, there is only one, one truth. This is like, well, if that's what you get to from denouncing the Rolling Stones, then I'm not interested. You know. I feel like we could go on a long time, but I want to gradually transition to the concert. So do you all have questions or comments you want to kick in over the next few minutes? Yeah, Ben. Um, in Cardew's uh, Shop House and Serve Imperialism, one of the notions that uh, he posits, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that a, uh, one of the most effective strategies for a composer to be revolutionary would be through total uh, immersion of their life within the working class populace. And uh, I'm just wondering to what degree either you subscribe to that notion or how that has uh, contributed to your stance on uh, these thoughts. Well, I, th I mean, he did that for the end of his life. 
to his credit. Um, and if you look at his later pieces, they're they're not involved with the sort of you know like those Stockhausen work or with the the work he was doing with um, Treatise, you know, um, the earlier graphic scores. And so I think that that you know um, that was a choice that he made, and he followed through with it. But it, he also kind of stopped being a composer of art music, I think, which is totally his choice. Um, I would say that's not something that I would want to do, and I disagree that that's the only way that a composer can uh, you know, engage with political ideas. Um, that was the way that he needed to do it, and he did it, and I think, I mean, Frederick Chevsky has a theory that you know, he was killed in, I think, 1982, maybe, by a hit-and-run driver in London, and a lot of people think it was an assassination. Apparently, he was um, involved in sort of getting involved. This is Cardi 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 yeah, yeah. Getting involved with fighting against these <coughs> neo-fascist Nazi groups in London, and uh, the, one of the reasons that they, they took him out. Um, and that also kind of is part of his commitment, sort of what Ted was saying about activism, you know. But I, I'm not... For better or worse, I'm not in a position like Bob Ostertag was where I'm willing to go to the jungles of South America. Um, that's just not who I am. I don't know that that makes me a bad person, <laughs> necessarily, but yeah. it's just a different... No, it does. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's a pretty arrogant assumption to say that. To say that. I, don't, I, think it's a, I think it's a ridiculous notion, actually, that like you would be... That that's the way that... That's the way to devote yourself to anything is to, to inauthentically do anything. Yeah, he can't to pretend system. that you are someone that you're not. He can't, to, he can't then, ungo to prep school. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, 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 it strikes me as pretty patriarchal to to uh, to, uh, to to do that. You know, to say to say like, um, I no, well, really, what the only thing anyone can really do is just um, the best thing to do is to is to immerse yourself among. Uh, among the poor that you can like really, that's the way to really teach them. That's what it sounds like to me. I think it's, I think, you know, not, not, that, not that he was arrogant to do that, necessarily, but to say that that's the right way for everyone. I think it was probably the authentic decision for him. I don't know, but you know more about Freddie than I do, but, and you do too, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, no, I, no, I think that's ridiculous. But this article, Stockhausen Serves Imperialism is also a new blue wave and totally worth reading. It's really fascinating. Um, so th thanks for bringing that up. It's a cool one. Another question or two? Yes. I think there is a difference, though, between making that choice, considering the microphone and choosing to not use a microphone, and ignoring the existence of the microphone. Which oh, I no, I'm not saying that you yeah, should, yeah. but it's just like, but I totally agree. one of them should be still existing. Totally. I mean, one, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. One of the things I find really satisfying about Ted's piece that you're going to hear tonight is, if you are a fan of the music of Morton Feldman, I think you'll hear the quiet sounds, if you're a fan of Rash metal, you hear those sounds. Like I feel like it, you know, the microphone actually allows him to, or the amplification that we're using allows him to engage with that, and the instrumentation he's using allows him to engage with the whole, the whole gamut, um, which I think is, you know, I think I think that's, it's certainly it's not novel, but I think it's nice to hear a piece that kind of turns on a dime and goes from one to the other. Yeah, I, I sorry, I didn't mean to, um, like, jump down your throat with the microphone thing. I was like. <laughs> Oh, no. no. <laughs> I just realized I was like, what do you mean microphone? But I, I guess what I was thinking was like, um, the microphone can be can be used really quietly too, I guess. Absolutely. Okay. Maybe one more question. 
Yeah, Andy. I guess I wonder, I'm always wondering about how one enters music, and you, you were speaking about theater uh, and writing first, and I know that you come from opera uh, family, but I wonder if you could speak a little about how, in your case, how you were led to music through you know, these other disciplines, and what was it about music that spoke to you? Well, you know, I would say that I, I actually was involved in music first, hmm. but at the act of writing music came after writing prose and writing plays and making a terrible movie, you know. So I went through a lot of, like, kind of creative things. But I started out as a drummer. I played in a fight and drum corps in New Jersey from the age of eight, playing all of, you know, Revolutionary War songs, uh, Civil War songs. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a very specific, yeah, it's a very cultural specific. background. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And Danny Boy, you know, because St. Patrick's Day. I should say that you guys will have plenty of opportunity to talk to David and Ted about these things, about the music and everything else. Stick around. Afterwards, we'll have a reception. And for the truly committed among you and the truly bun shop loving among you, we'll have an after show and they'll be hanging out with us hopefully later in the night. So thank you, Ted. Thank you, David. And we look forward to hearing you. Thank you, Judah. Thanks.